Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the 13th Annual Common Reading Author Lecture. Reina Grande is the author of the best-selling memoir, The Distance Between Us, where she writes about her life before and after she arrived in the United States from Mexico as an undocumented child immigrant. This much anticipated sequel, A Dream Called Home, is this year's common reading book, where over 5,000 of our new students will be learning about Reina's story and participate in programs throughout the year. Her other works also include her novels, Across 100 Mountains and Dancing with Butterflies, which were published to critical acclaim. Writing about immigration, family separation, language trauma, the price of the American dream, and her writing journey, Raina's work has appeared in the New York Times, the Dallas Morning News, CNN, the Lily at the Washington Post, BuzzFeed, among others. Born in Iguala, Guerrero, Mexico, Raina was two years old when her father left for the United States to find work. Her mother followed her father north two years later, leaving Reina and her siblings behind in Mexico. In 1985, when Reina was nine, she left Iguala to make her own journey north. After attending Pasadena City College for two years, Reina became the first person in her family to set foot in a university. She went on to attain her Bachelor of Arts in Creative Writing and Film and Video from the University of California, Santa Cruz. She later received her Master's of Fine Arts in Creative Writing from Antioch University. Throughout her memoir, A Dream Called Home, Reina writes how she navigated through the transition to college, her career, and how she became the person she is today. Today, we have the chance to listen to Reina share her story with us. Please join me in welcoming Reina Grande. Hello. Can you see me? All right. Um, well, hello, everybody. Um, it's such a pleasure to be joining you this afternoon. I really, really, really wish it was in person. I was supposed to go visit you next month in July, and I was really looking forward to meeting you all in person and being able to um, to be there to see you start your journey as university students. But uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, we are where we are today and um, in a pandemic, which nobody expected us to be in. But uh, we're trying to do our best in terms of uh, rearranging our lives and continuing to give the best of ourselves and, and to make sure that you start your university journeys in the best way possible. So I'm really glad we were able to adapt. You know, that, that's something that we all seem to be doing recently is learning how to adapt. And I'm so glad to be able to join you here today, uh, even though it's remotely and I'm uh, very far away from you in my home in California, but uh, very, very happy to be here regardless. So, um, I am very grateful to the university for choosing my book, A Dream Called Home, to share with you all as you begin your university journeys. Uh, to me, you know, it's such an honor, really, to know that you are reading my book, and hopefully you will find some inspiration and some encouragement for your, your time at the university. You know, I really hope that as you read it, it gave you a little insight in terms of what to do and what not to do and what to expect. And, and um, hopefully you will have a much, much better and richer experience at the university. And you know, whatever challenge you encounter along the way, I hope that you are able to beat all those challenges and overcome them and continue to work towards your dreams. One of the things that I wanted to do in writing A Dream Called Home was to capture, you know, the, what it's like to begin uh, life as a university student. I think for me, and I'm sure for many of you, you know, this is a time that is really exciting, but it's also a time that is very scary. You know, there are um, so many uncertainties, right? You start this journey at the university with dreams, with plans, with hopes, with aspirations, and also with a little bit of fear. 
and a little bit of uncertainty. And also, you know, if you're like me, you probably wondered, right, um, do I have it in me? Do I really have it in me to succeed? And of, I want to tell you that, you know, that, that fear, that vulnerability, the worry that you might be feeling is very normal. And I actually would be more concerned about you if you weren't feeling those things. Because when you are afraid, when you worry, um, that means that you really do care, you know, that, that you care about what happens. And it also means that because of that fear and that worry that you might be feeling, you are going to do your best to make sure that you do everything that's in your power to succeed, to get ahead. So one of the things that, you know, I, I really wish that we were launching you into your journeys as university students in a much better circumstance and not during a pandemic and not during a time of, you know, social unrest and police brutality. But at the same time, I feel that because you're starting your journeys during these very uncertain times, uh, this might be a really good opportunity, you know, to think about what's going on in the world and how are you going to use your, your time at the university to develop um, your talents and your skills that you will later be able to use um, to make some very positive changes in our society. You know, uh, I think the time that we're experiencing right now, uh, it's really teaching us that, that maybe we, uh, we were a little too comfortable with how things were and that we were not as prepared as we should have been. So when the quarantine is over, when we get through um, the times that we are living through right now, I don't want us to go back to normal, right? I don't want us to go back to the same old, same old. I would really like us to emerge from this situation um, better, stronger, and, and a, a more unified um, society and country. So um, I, I hope that you use this time to really think about, you know, what are you going to learn at the university? What are things that you can do to make sure that when you graduate uh, from FIU, you will be able to contribute to our society and to make it better and to make positive changes in the world. So let's turn this, uh, you know, negative situation into a positive situation, into a learning experience where we can use this time um, to work towards transforming our, ourselves and transforming the world that we live in. So I, I, I know I'm probably asking too much of you, but you are, you know, the future of this country. You are uh, the generation that right now is um, developing and, and, and learning and, and, and becoming who you're going to be. So um, I, I am going to put that expectation on you in that I really want to see you uh, emerge in the, you know, four years from now when you graduate, uh, the kind of person that's going to just go out there into the world and to use all of your talents, your creativity, your passion to make just really wonderful changes, much, much needed changes in our society. So, so that's what I'm expecting from you. Um, I think right now you are probably, you know, overwhelmed with, with uh, this transition into university and I know you have a lot of expectations on you already from your family, from yourself, from your teachers, uh, but definitely um, society is going to have expectations of you and I, I have expectations of you as well. So, um, you know, I know you read A Dream Called Home or I know you were supposed to read A Dream Called Home. So I hope that most of you have uh, read it or at least read a uh, part of it. And as you can see, uh, the book, I divided it into sections. I, uh, I started with the first half of the book 
is about uh, my time at the university. And then the second half of the book is when I graduated and um, everything that happened to me after graduation and just me trying to become an adult and living in the real world and all the mistakes that I made and all the obstacles I had to overcome along the way in order to finally become the person that, that I was meant to be. So um, in the first half of the book, it begins when I arrive at the university and I wanted to start it there because that was the beginning of, of my journey, you know, in that, in, in, in the time that I was writing about those 10 years, um, I went there with a very specific uh, plan of uh, honing my skills as a writer, learning all the tools and techniques that I needed in order to become a professional writer. So I hope that right now, you know, that you're starting your time at the university, that you also have a plan of what you want to accomplish in the, in the time that you're there at FIU. Um, if you don't have a plan yet, it's okay. You know, you just started, you have the rest of the year to figure out what it is that you want to do, what you want to study, what are your interests. So I was very fortunate because when I arrived at the university, I already knew what I wanted to do, which is to, to be a writer. And I was lucky that, you know, I went to community college uh, first and I met my English professor, who was the person who put me on the writing path. You know, this English professor was the one who pulled me aside and said, hey, Reina, have you ever considered uh, pursuing a career as a professional writer? And I had never thought of that. It had never crossed my mind that I could be a writer because I didn't grow up reading um, Latino literature. I didn't know that Latinos could write and publish books. So even though I, I like to write and I love to read, I just never thought that I could write a book. So thanks to this professor uh, who put that idea in my head and who helped me believe that my stories mattered, that I had experiences that needed to be told and celebrated. I arrived at, at the university with that, that goal, you know, with that dream of becoming a writer. So during the time that I spent at the university, I, I devoted myself completely to making sure that I learned everything I needed to learn to reach that dream of being a writer. So I think right now, you know, the time that you have right now at the university, I really hope that, you know, you use that to um, discover, if you don't know yet, to discover what your passions are. You know, what is that one thing that you cannot live without? What is that one thing that lights your fire, that gives you joy, that gives you a deep satisfaction? Uh, find that thing if you haven't found it already and, and, um, and do everything you can to learn as much as you can and to become a master at that. So um, if you don't know yet what it is that you want to, to do, you know, uh, what your passion is, you could use this time to discover that by um, trying different things. You know, one of, one of my uh, biggest regrets uh, when I was at university was that I did not do any internships. I didn't even know, first of all, that I could do them. Uh, I didn't know that, that those opportunities existed. But, you know, if you could find internships in the fields that you're interested in, that would really help you because it will give you hands-on experience and it will really show you whether or not th that field is right for you. So, um, Hopefully, you know, when, when the quarantine is over and when we are once again able to go out into the world, I, I hope you can find some opportunities for internships so that you can explore your, your interests and, and find your passion. So uh, while I was at the university, I think for me, it was really a time of trying to um, learn how to be independent, right? Uh, learning how to make my own decisions 
and learning how to hold myself accountable for my own mistakes as well. You know, and that is something that I, I want you to think about is that it's okay to make mistakes. This is the time. If you're going to make mistakes, you know, this is the time when you make mistakes. But, you know, the mistakes that you make should be um, learning experiences, right? Where um, they teach you lessons that eventually are going to make you a better, stronger person. So I made a lot of mistakes while I was at the university, but I always got up, you know, after I made a mistake and I fell, I would get myself up and start again and try again. And just making sure that, you know, I didn't allow myself to fail. And to me, you know, failure is not trying that that's failure. You know, when you don't even bother to try If you try and you don't succeed, you know, you still win. So make sure that um, as you're as you're going through your time here at the university, you know, just just don't be afraid to take risks. Don't be afraid to um, to not succeed on your first attempt or your second attempt. Just just keep trying and also take it one step at a time. Don't, don't get overwhelmed, especially this year. I feel, you know, your first year at the university can be quite overwhelming, uh, but just take it one class at a time, one quarter at a time, and make sure that you get help. You should not be, you know, you shouldn't feel lonely and you shouldn't feel alone in this journey. Um, Talk to your teachers, your counselors, your classmates, and make sure that you're using all the resources at your disposal that the university will provide for you. So don't ever, don't, don't let yourself get lonely and certainly do not be alone in this journey uh, that you're beginning as a university student. So the, the second half of the book, um, it takes place after I I left the university. And one of the mistakes that I made that I really hope you guys don't make is um, that while I was at the university, I was just so focused on succeeding at the university and and, and on reaching my, my, my goals that I had at the university, but I did not do my homework in terms of preparing for when I left, you know, and, and the thing is that time goes by so fast that before you know it, you're going to be graduating and you're going to be out in the real world. And that is something that I didn't think about. Um, I just been, you know, enjoying my time that, that I had at the university and dreaming all these dreams but I didn't do the homework and that I just didn't prepare and have a really clear idea of what I was going to do once I graduated and once I was out in the real world. And it was really traumatic when I graduated. I literally felt like I had been kicked out of the university instead of having graduated um, just because I was so unprepared for that transition back into the real world where I was on my own. I no longer had teachers. I no longer had, you know, that support system that the university provided. I no longer had um, scholarships and and student uh, loans and financial aid to help me um, pay my bills. I didn't have any of that. So that transition was actually really traumatic of of going out into the real world as a young um, adult and expected to, you know, support myself and to be on my own. So as you write about in the book, because I was so unprepared, I ended up having to crash on my brother's couch for many, many months while I struggled to find a job um, because, uh, you know, to my surprise, uh, with creative writing, you don't exactly, you know, go out into the world and then get a job right away in creative writing. It takes a while to make your way uh, as a writer. So I I really hope that, you know, during this next four years that you're going to be at the university, uh, you start thinking about what, what, what's life going to be like for you when you graduate and um, what are some things that you're going to do to make sure that the transition is as you know, least painful as possible, and that you're going to land on your feet 
when when you graduate and that you're going to be able to to take care of yourself and and um and you know and really like like fulfill your potential when you graduate but uh i was i was fortunate you know i was i was really fortunate that even though i went through that that uncertain transition between university and and um you know graduating and then not knowing what to do after i graduated not knowing how to go about making my dream a reality i was really fortunate that i don't know that the universe uh, divine intervention and also my own stubbornness uh, helped me to get to where I really needed to be, which was to, to, to be on the path of becoming a published writer and eventually being able to go on and publish um, several books. And the latest book, of course, is the one that you read, uh, Dream Called Home. So uh, Dream Called Home uh, it's about, you know, like I said, my university experience after my university experience, and it's about my, my dream of becoming a writer, but on a deeper level on, uh, you know, what we call in writing, we call it uh, a theme, you know, that, that, that thematic arc of the story. It's really about my pursuit of having a home. That, that's what's at the, at the deeper level of that book. Um, you know, I write about my writing, but I mostly write about my longing for a home. And that's the theme of the, the book. And that is why I titled it A Dream Called Home, because it really centers the whole book, every single chapter centers around that idea of home and my longing for a home. Um, so if you see like, you know, the first chapter is about me leaving home and the second, third and fourth chapters are about me trying to, to find a home uh, at the university to try to find a, a, a place to belong, right? To have that sense of belonging and then there's an, the other chapter when I bring my sister, my little sister to come live with me. It's, it was my attempt of trying to make a home for myself and for my sister. And of course, you know, in the next chapter, you see that that did not work out. So I was once again losing my home. So if you analyze the book, you know, chapter by chapter, you will see that the, the recurring theme, the central theme is about home. So, um, and to me, you know, as I was writing the book and thinking about, about home and what home meant to me and why I had this longing for a home. And I was thinking about how um, the biggest irony the biggest irony of my life is that my father left us in Mexico to come to the U.S. because he wanted to build us a house. But in trying to build us a house, he destroyed our home. So that's the biggest irony of my life, right? In wanting to build us a house, my father destroyed our home. And ever since he left, uh, when I was two years old, uh, my home just started to fall apart. And then my mother left. So then my home really fell apart. And all I had now were my siblings. And my whole childhood was really defined by me um, needing a home and not being able to, to have that because my parents were gone. And then watching how little by little my home was being destroyed. So in a dream called home, I explore, you know, that longing and that need for that home. And, and then, you know, eventually, as you see in the book, eventually I come to the realization that my father was never going to give me a home, that my mom was not going to give me a home, that nobody was going to give me a home, that the only person that could give me a home was me. I was the only one that could build that home for myself. And when I realized that, it was so empowering to me 
because then I realized, you know, that I needed to stop um, looking at my dad and, and looking at my mom and blaming them for not being able to give me that home that I wanted. And I needed to stop having relationships that were hurtful to me that, you know, there were bad relationships, the wrong relationships, just because I had this desperate desire for someone to give me a home. And I think one of the most empowering things that happened to me as a young person was just realizing that, you know what, nobody is going to give me that. I have to give it to myself. And when I realized that, um, as I said, it was really empowering. And then I began to think of, you know, how am I going to build that home that I want? And time, you know, I didn't have any money to, to, um, to do anything, but what I had in abundance were dreams and words. And that is how I began to build a home uh, with the dreams and the words that I had. And eventually I realized that my writing was my home. You know, that really was the place in my writing where I felt um, that comfort, that security, that stability, that love that I had always yearned for. It was at home where I could be myself. And I embraced that. And so, um, you know, that expression, um, home is where the heart is. And I really do believe that. And I have put my heart into every single book that I've written. My heart is in there. And that is why my books, my writing is my home, because that is where my heart is. So it was a, a really, to me, it was such a transformative experience to discover, um, discover this idea of being able to create a home through my words and, 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 and through my dreams. So I really hope um, that you guys can think about, you know, what is it that that you're longing for, right? You know, what is it that you're missing in your life? And what are the things that you can do to find that, to, to, to find that self-fulfillment? And I really do believe that one way to do that is to find your passion, you know, to find that one thing that interests you that you want to learn more about and, and, you know, that you want to use all of your, your talents and your skills, and you want to put your heart and soul into it to, to make sure that you learn everything you can. So, you know, think about, um, there's so many, there's so many fields at your disposal, so many careers, so many things that you can pursue. And I really hope that you're able to, to find that career, that perfect career uh, that's meant for you and that you are meant for, you know, that career that doesn't feel like a job, that it feels like, you know, something that you wake up for every single day and you look forward to doing. And um, I, I don't know, I think it's just such an exciting moment for you right now. Uh, because the future is uh, wide open, you know, the future is going to be what you make it. So this is the time when you start making, um, I, I, in the, in the dream called home, I called it, it was more about, um, you know, being inside a, a cocoon, right? Like a, like a butterfly that goes from the caterpillar stage to the cocoon stage. So right now at the university, you're entering that cocoon stage. And this is where you start to change and develop. And some of those changes are, are going to be very subtle and some of them are going to be obvious. And then um, in the next few years, you're going to emerge from that cocoon and, and transformed into a beautiful butterfly. So uh, and enjoy your time. And I really do want to wish you all the best while you're here at the university, but also once you leave and you go out into the world to bring us your, your light and, and your love and your passion to make this place a, a better place for all of us. 
So thank you so much. And uh, I want to open that up for questions now because I'm sure that you you guys have questions for me about the book. And, and I, feel free to ask me any questions that you want. There's no right or wrong question. I'm, I'm really good at answering any question that you have. So thank you. Awesome. Um, so for those of you who don't know, at the bottom of your bar, um, you'll see a button that says Q&A. So if you want to go ahead and ask Raina a question, um, feel free to type it in and we'll just go by the order that we receive all of those questions. Um, so Raina, the first question that you have is, do you regret the price you had to pay for a shot at the American dream, the separation from your home and from your family? Yeah, thank you. That's a really good question. Do I regret the price I had to pay? I really don't. I don't regret it. Um, and, I, and the reason why I don't regret it is because I really love where I am today. You know, I love my career. I love my, my family, my, my new family that I've been able to, to, to create with my husband. I love where I am and I love who I am. And I know that I wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for everything that happened, right? And the price that I had to pay was a big price and I'm still suffering from it. You know, um, I think that that trauma really left some very deep wounds and, and uh, some of them have healed and some of them have not fully healed. But one of the things I think about a lot is, you know, when I look at my children, I look at my children and their, their childhoods have been so completely different from what I went through. You know, my kids have always grown up in a stable, loving home. All their needs have been met, uh, physical, emotional, psychological needs, every, everything. I mean, they are um, very confident in who they are. They are really happy kids. And to me, that makes it all worth it. You know, it makes it worth it in that I tell myself, I'm so glad that it happened to me so that it would never have to happen to my children. And I know that from this point forward, things are going to change, right? Because of what happened to me and because of what I've done with what happened to me, now my kids are going to have a much, much better uh, lives and hopefully, you know, their children and their children after them. So, yeah, I think sometimes you just have to think about, you know, what is, what is the price that you have to pay for, um, making making uh your life and 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 the life of the future generations in your family better than what they are now um so next question do you have any tips for connecting with professors mentors etc yeah uh well i mean first of all you know you have to put in the work right um you know teachers are they're, they're going to take an interest in you and, and they're going to try to connect with you. And sometimes they have a lot of students, so maybe you're not going to get as much of the attention that, that you deserve. So then you should be the one to be reaching out to them, right? Make sure that you're being proactive when it comes to that. You know, don't let any, don't wait for anybody to come to you and say, hey, what do you need? You know, you know what you need. So make sure that you're proactive and you go and find the people that are going to help you with those needs that you have. So your teachers are, they're all going to have office hours. Make sure that you use those office hours, you know, make sure that you talk to them, that they get to know you. And if you don't understand, you know, sometimes you might not understand their lectures. You might not understand the assignments that they give you make sure that you talk to them and ask them, ask them for help so that you do understand so that then you can do the work that you're supposed to be doing instead of guessing, you know, what it is that you're supposed to be doing. So definitely always be proactive when it comes to that, you know, when it comes to finding um, mentors, when it comes to finding the help that you need, you, you have to be the one knocking on doors so that's something that, you know, I had to do when I was in college and that's how I met. That's how I developed that really beautiful relationship with my English teacher was because, you know, she took, she would praise me for my writing and I could see, you know, that, that, that she took an interest in my writing, but I was the one who would go knock on her office uh, door 
and 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 reach out to her and make that connection. So make sure that you're knocking on doors. That that's that's what I want to see you do. Just knock on doors. So next question, your your book was amazing. How does it feel to oh. have the impact you've had on so many young college students? Uh, oh, thank you so much. That that's that's really sweet. Um, you know, I think for me it's just been such a such a beautiful experience because when I started writing uh, these memoirs, you know, I, when I wrote The Distance Between Us and then I wrote A Dream Called Home and they're very personal and I, I definitely don't shy away, you know, from writing uh, things that, what, that made me feel really vulnerable and really exposed, right? And then there are things that I write about that I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not proud of, you know, mistakes that I made that, that I'm ashamed of, but in being able to open myself up, you know, and making myself vulnerable, I realized that then I was able to um, connect, you know, with, with young people like yourselves who are going through those same uncertainties and, and feeling those same fears and, and, you know, having the same questions and worries. So to me, that, that makes me really happy to be able to then realize that I'm not alone. And hopefully that when you read the book and, you know, if you found connections with your own story to my story, and you also realize that you're not alone, right? That this is the human experience and that there's nothing wrong with you whatsoever. And you just need to, you know, embrace who you are and celebrate who you are. So I, I really hope that through my words that I shared with you, we've been able to make that connection and that I have been able to inspire you and encourage you as, as you go on in, in this journey that, that you're on. So while in community college, before your teacher recommended you and guided you to become a writer, what was your plan? Uh, what was my plan? I oh, um, There were a few things that I was thinking of, but one of the things that I thought at the moment when I was at community college was being a visual artist. I like drawing and I like painting and I had this idea that maybe I could be like an animator for Walt Disney or something, you know. Um, and I, I had this really funny experience. I was taking an art class at the community college. And one time my professor, um, my English professor saw me working on this painting. I was doing a painting of like, it was a silly painting, like a still life of vegetables, you know? And, I, and she, she came to stand next to me and she was watching me paint and I'm trying to show off my painting skills so that she could see that I was actually meant to be a painter, you know, be a, a visual artist. And she's watching me paint for a little bit. And then she looks at me and she's like, Reina, you're better off being a writer. And that was the end of my uh, painting career. Oh, uh, <laughs> all right. If you haven't, if you hadn't had Diana, Marta, and Mika, do you think you would still have found your path to become a writer? Oh man, yeah. You know, I asked myself that question so many times because, um, you know, my my older siblings, uh, my my older siblings didn't finish college. You know, they dropped out of college. And sometimes people ask me, like, how come you did it and they didn't? And I, one of the answers that I always give is that, you know, they didn't have mentors. They did not have a mentor um, supporting them and encouraging them and helping to get up, you know, when they fell. They did not have that guidance. And I really do believe that because I had mentors, because of those three teachers that I had, that, that, that really made the difference in terms of where I ended up, right? And being able to graduate from university, being able to reach the kind of success that I've reached, I, I really do believe it was um, in part because of these mentors that I had. 
So I am going to be eternally grateful for them, for giving me, you know, the encouragement and the guidance and sometimes the strength that I needed to, to keep going. Do you have any tips on how to prepare for life after college better? Yeah, I mean, you know, like I mentioned earlier, like one of the things that you can do while you're right now that you're at the university is to um, start exploring, like, you know, do internships, right? Um, it's easier to get internships when you're a student than when you graduate. And I learned that the hard way because when I graduated, I, I tried to get internships later on. And it was just really hard because they were not paid internships. And at that point in my life, I had bills. I had a lot of bills. I had my student loans I had to repay. So it was harder for me to do like free stuff later on than when I was in, in college. But I, I really do think that, you know, you can start exploring and, and trying to make connections in the field that you want to pursue that because that's invaluable because you know once you start to make those connections you you start to network once you are about to graduate you can use all of those connections to you know um, find a job to make sure that that you have the opportunities that you need that when you graduate, you know what, what you're going to do and you know where you're going to end up. So that, that, that's the way you can land on your feet after graduation is by preparing yourself before you graduate and, and, um, and doing those kinds of the networking, you know, so that you know people in your field once you graduate. Did you have any other ideas for the title or did you know since the beginning um, the title for your memoir? Uh, the title for the memoir, um, I wanted to call it The Home I Carry. And that was because of that metaphor, you know, of the turtle. When I read, you know, Gloria Anzaldúa's work and she she's, talks about the turtle and she says, I am a turtle. I carry, wherever I go, I carry home on my back. And that image of the turtle um, and that, that idea that you could create a home that you can carry with you everywhere you go, it really appealed to me. So I was thinking about the home I carry as the title. But then when I Googled it to see if there were other books that had that title, uh, a lot of articles popped up. And these were articles about gun loss, you know, the, the home carry is when you're allowed to have a, a gun at home. And I just didn't want my book to be associated with guns. So then I had to come up with a different title and I still use the home I carry as a title for this one, you know, one of the, the sections in, in, the, in the book, but I had to come up with the new title. And my agent helped me come up with a dream called home. And I thought it was appropriate just because I know that, you know, the, this, th that dream, the, that I, the biggest dream I've ever had was to have a home. Have you found peace and forgiveness with your parents for the childhood that they gave you? Yes, yes. And, you know, writing these memoirs really, really helped me with that because I used to have a lot of anger. I used to have a lot of anger. I used to have a lot of resentment, sometimes even hate, you know, for my parents because of what they did and, and the bad choices that they made. Um, and when I wrote the memoirs, it gave me a chance to understand that my parents are human beings you know, very flawed human beings, but also at some points in their lives, they also had good intentions that for one reason or another, you know, got sabotage. Uh, I know my father, you know, my father was a very, very flawed man, especially because of his alcoholism and also, you know, his very violent temper. But my father also had some very beautiful qualities. You know, he was a dreamer. He had very high um, expectations of us. He never let us slack off. 
and he made us into very, very hard working individuals. And that's something that, that Mago, my brother Carlos and I have in common. It's just how hardworking we are and how focused we are, you know, in, in making sure that we're taking care of ourselves and we're taking care of our families. And we learned that from, from my dad. So when I wrote these memoirs, it really gave me a chance to understand my parents, to forgive my parents, and, and to know that, you know, they're just human beings that tried to do the best that they could with what they had at their disposal and, and, and what they knew, right? So um, I think sometimes when you have some complicated relationships with your parents, it takes a while to come to that understanding. But I, I really hope that, you know, those of you who might be struggling also with some, um, uh, I don't know, um, complicated relationships with, with your parents, I, I hope that you also reach that understanding eventually that we're all human beings, deeply flawed human beings. So what are your current dreams? What are my current dreams? Uh, well, I have um, my dreams of uh, writing other books. You know, right now I have a, a contract for two books that I need to write. So I'm really excited about that. And then I have ideas for other books that I want to write. So I have plan. Uh, I have these plans of um, more books that that I want to read. I want to write. Uh, I also have this silly dream. Maybe it's silly. I don't know. But I want to go live abroad. That's an experience that I haven't had. And that's actually one of my regrets when I was at university, that I didn't go study abroad. Um, so because I didn't do it at, when I was uh, at the university, I want to do it now as an adult. So I was um, dreaming of moving to Spain, even if it's just for one year but to give myself the experience of living in another country. And the reason why I picked Spain was because, um, you know, when, when I go to Mexico and I speak Spanish, my, I, I guess I speak Spanish with an American accent or something, because the first thing they tell me in Mexico when I speak Spanish is, oh, you're an American, you're not Mexican, right? But then over here, you know, in the U.S., uh, I'm too Mexican and I'm not American enough. And I feel like I'm always having to prove myself, right? Having to prove that I belong here, that, that I need to be accepted for who I am. And, and I'm, I'm constantly like feeling um, that question, my identity question. But then when I went to Spain a few years ago and I started speaking Spanish over there, the first thing they asked me was, oh, are you Mexican? And I feel like the only place I could be Mexican is um, in Spain. So I decided that, that I want to move over there and uh, be able to see, see the world, you know, from a different perspective. And I also think that if I were to live somewhere else where it's not my native country, Mexico, where it's not, you know, this country in the U.S., it might help me uh, be able to get a different perspective on these two countries. So, so, so that's another dream that I have. All right, so next question. Hi, Reina, do you have any advice for students that have chosen a major that doesn't immediately guarantee them a job in their dream career? <sighs> yes. Well, first of all, you know, don't let anybody discourage you from it. I know sometimes, um, you know, when, when I was pursuing this, this dream of being a writer, sometimes I felt a little discouraged because I knew that it's not a traditional career, right? It's not the kind of career where you graduate and then you look for a job in that field and you get a job. Uh, if you're pursuing a non-traditional career, I mean, you are going to have to deal with the fact that things are not going to happen as quickly as you want them to be, you know, that sometimes it's going to take years to be able to make the kind of income that you need to make in order to support yourself a full time doing what you love. So if you know that and if you accept that, 
then you can start planning on, you know, what are you going to do to support yourself while you pursue um, this dream. So be realistic. I want you to dream, but I want you to dream with your eyes wide open, which is something I didn't do. Uh, I want you to dream with your eyes wide, wide open. And what that means is have your dream, but also try to, to be realistic in how long it might take to, to achieve that dream and to be able to support yourself doing what you love. So have, um, have a, 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 I don't want to say a plan B, but, but definitely have something on the side, you know, if, if, even if you have to minor in something else so that, you know, you could major in that, that thing that you love and then have a minor in, in something that's going to uh, get you a job um, that's going to help you support yourself while you're pursuing that other thing. So make sure that you do have some kind of plan though. Um, so I know we're coming close to the end time. Um, are there any last words you want to say? If you wanted me to throw down another question or two? Yeah, yeah. Let's do let's do a few more questions. All right. So you let me know when you want me to stop. <laughs> question: um, Do you have any tips with publishing companies and working with agents? Any tips uh, with publishing companies and working with agents? Yeah. Um, first of all. You can do some research in terms of, you know, what kind of books are you writing? What kind of genre? What's, what's the style, you know, um, the story that you're writing? And try to find other, other books that are similar to what you're doing. And in those books, you know, if you read the acknowledgments page, uh, authors usually thank their agents for the help. And you can make a list of agents that like the kind of work that you're writing. You also make a list of publishers that are publishing that kind of work. So then once you have your list, um, that really narrows things down, right? So that you're not, you know, out there trying to like figure out who to send your work to. Make a list, make, do that research. Make a list of agents, make a list of publishers that, that publish the kind of work that you do, and then uh, contact them, you know, send them a query letter and say, you know, my name is so-and-so, I'm working on this project, this is what it's about, may I send you an excerpt or, you know, a writing sample. So make sure that, that you do that. And you could, you could Google um, how to write a query letter and, and you'll see samples on that. So make sure you do that research. So next and also, also, last thing, you're not too young to do it. You know, uh, I, my agent had a, a client who was 17 years old and she had already sold like two books. So don't think that you're too young to start um, reaching out to agents. Um, so the next one is, uh, I cried and laughed with your memoir. It's really amazing. Um, you clearly feel, you can clearly feel that you poured out your heart into every single word. Do you feel vulnerable talking about your book because you're sharing a lot of personal experiences? I do feel really vulnerable, but I also feel really empowered. And I feel empowered because, you know, for a long time, like all through my childhood, my adulthood, my young adulthood, I felt ashamed. Shame was really the biggest thing I felt about these experiences. And when you feel shame, you want to keep quiet and not say anything about these experiences. You want to forget about them. You wanna pretend that they never happened and you buried them very, very deeply under your shame. But then you walk around with this weight on your back. You know, you walk around with, with that, that, that feeling of shame. And that really impacts your confidence, right? It really gives you a low self-esteem. When, you, when you're ashamed of who you are, you, you have a low self-esteem. And uh, um, so what happened was um, when I decided to do the opposite instead of feeling ashamed and never talking about these experiences, I decided to empower myself by then going public 
with these experiences and owning up to them, you know, and saying, you know, this is who I am and really owning the experiences. And uh, so in making myself vulnerable, I ended up making myself empowered, which is something you will never expect, right? But that it really does happen. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to be vulnerable because once you allow that vulnerability to come out, um, that's when the transformation happens and then you, you become empowered and you become very confident and proud in who you are. So what advice do you have for students that are facing difficult familial relationships? Uh, yeah, you know, those are really complicated because your family uh, is such a big part of, of who you are and they are really important and you know you love them and you want their acceptance you want their love you want to have um really strong beautiful relationships with them but your family could be the ones that that hold you up but your family could also be the ones that bring you down you know so you really need to be careful with that you know um don't let anybody bring you down even if it's the person that you love most, or especially the person that you love most can do the most damage. So don't allow that to happen. You know, ultimately, um, the, fam the family we get is the family we get. You know, we don't get to choose our families. We are born into these families, but you do get to choose how much you allow them to hurt you. That is the choice that that you that you do have so if you have a toxic relationship with your your families uh you need to remove yourself from from that uh for a while you know um at least until you 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 become stronger and more confident in yourself and if you want to you know, continue to have relationships with, with toxic people, at least you, you need to set some, some boundaries, right, of how much time you can spend with someone. And also make sure, you know, that, that you um, remain strong and that you do not let anybody uh, hurt you. So you do need to take care of yourself in that way. And there's nothing selfish about it. Don't ever feel that you're being selfish because you're actually being um, selfless with, with yourself, right? You are taking care of yourself. If you could have done anything different, what would it have been? If I could have done anything different, uh, I'm going to say, and, you know, since you guys read the book, you know, like, all the guys that I went out with and stuff. Like, I'm gonna say my love life would be the one thing I would love to do different. Uh, I think I, I, I put too much, too much value in, in those relationships. And part of that, you know, part of that was because the way my father messed me up in the head, right? Because my father was a very emotionally unavailable man and he just did not know how to love. Um, and I was so desperate for my father's love that I went out and I tried to find it in other men. And, um, and that really hurt me. And I think that happens a lot to, to us um, women. You know, we, we make the mistakes of when we don't have our father's love, we try to find it in, in other relationships. So, so I made that mistake. And I wish I hadn't. I wish I hadn't put that kind of value in, in what other men um, could do for me. And, but it was a learning experience because in putting myself in those situations, uh, thankfully, I eventually learned that, I, that the one person that needed to, you know, that, that was going to give me that, that kind of love was me. I needed to love myself. And I needed to stop looking for love in the wrong places because the right place was here with me. So I was really lucky that I, that I um, found that because I know uh, I, I have, you know, even in my family and, and, and in my, my friends, I see that sometimes 
we don't learn that lesson and we continue to get into bad relationships because we have not learned that we're the ones who need to love ourselves and to stop looking for love in, in, in wrong relationships. So first and foremost, I love your book. I could really feel the emotion behind it. I myself really do enjoy writing and even want to publish my own book. What tips do you have for upcoming writers? How did you find the strength to write your own personal story? Yeah, uh, well, I'm really excited to hear that you are um, becoming a, a writer and that you're thinking about writing your books and sharing them with the world. We definitely need, you know, the next generation of writers. So I'm, I'm very happy to hear this news. And yeah, I mean, I think the advice that I give is, first of all, you know, you need to hone your skills, right? So take as many classes as you can in writing, you know, and, and, and try to explore, you know, because if you write fiction, make sure that you're also taking a class in nonfiction, you know, or screenwriting or poetry, because all these different uh, forms of writing will inform your own writing and make you a better writer. So make sure that you're exploring all formats of writing. And you have to do a lot of writing to become a, a good writer. You, you have to write. You absolutely have to write. Uh, so make sure you have a, uh, a schedule, you know, uh, so that you develop the habit of, of writing. And, and you don't have to write every day. You know, some writers write every day but make sure that you do have some kind of schedule that you're sticking to, you know, even if, if it's on the weekends that, that you write, but make sure you put that into your schedule, your writing time. You also need to read a lot because you cannot be a good writer if you're not a good reader. So make sure that you're reading, you know, uh, hopefully in your classes, you will get some really interesting books to read, but also, you know, go, go to the library and, and, and do um, some research and find books that you can read for pleasure and to develop more of your, your writing skills that way. Um, and, you know, make sure that as you're, as you're getting better in your craft as a writer, you also doing the research in terms of the business because the business of writing is uh, really complicated and it's not something that is taught in schools. Usually in schools, you get a lot of craft, but you don't really get taught the business of writing. So make sure you're doing that research, you know, Google it and find out everything that you can about the business of writing so that you know what you need to do to succeed as a writer. Um, so we are, you know, continuing to push it on time a little bit. Um, I know we have a, another uh, to start at noon, um, mm -hmm. so we want to make sure that, um, you know, we have enough time for them to kind of transition out. Um, okay. So a, a couple more questions, and we'll kind of see where it goes from there. Um, so right. any advice on getting internships? What was that? Any advice on getting internships? Yeah, I'm sure um, the university probably has a, a, a resource um, for that, a resource department, some kind of center that they might help you get, um, you know, like, like uh, jobs and internships. I know when I was at the university, we had an office where, um, you know, you could go in there and find out what what places we're hiring or what. So I'm pretty sure there's some inter internships uh, list somewhere. And if there aren't, then you can reach out to companies, you know, that are in your field. Make a list of companies that you would like to work at, that you would like to uh, do an internship and email, email them. Email them and say, you know, I'm a student at FIU. I'm really interested in doing an internship. Um, this is my availability. This is when I can come in. These are the hours that I can, I can do. Um, so you, you do the work, you know, you reach out to people and, and I'm pretty sure that you are going to get, get something because I, I think a lot of companies are, are open for, for interns. Um, I love the connection you constantly make in the book between your life and nature around you, like the trees at UC. UCSC and the walks you used to take on campus. 
How would you say this view of nature has inspired your way of writing and connecting your life events to the nature around you? Oh, that's such a nice question. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, you know, I was never really exposed to nature because growing up in LA, LA, there's just, there's just not a whole lot of nature in LA. There's a lot of concrete. Um, but yeah, definitely not that, that, uh, it, at least for me, you know, I, I know that they're, they're like parks and, and places that you can get to if you drive to them. But in my family, we just didn't have, have a lot of access to, to nature. But when I got to UC Santa Cruz, I mean, the, the campus is built in a forest. So you are immersed in nature and it really helped me to learn how to appreciate it. So now as an adult, you know, I, I wish I could show you guys my garden. I have, I have a huge garden and it takes up a lot of time to take care of it. But what, what nature and, and, you know, gardening has really taught me, and, and I apply that in my writing, is just that it takes patience, it takes time, and, and you really have to, you know, uh, be patient in, in watching something grow, right? So when I'm sitting down to write a book, I know that I'm not going to write it from one day to the next, you know. I know that it's going to take me years and years to, to watch this book grow and become what it needs to be and then once it's grown I have to prune it you know and make it tight and and make it uh look good so that's kind of what I see in 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 taking care of all my plants is uh watching them grow and and fertilizing them and nurturing them and then also um taking the 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 shears and and cutting, you know, and, and pruning it down because I know that that's going to make them um, look better. So, um, Will your son be attending the University of California, Santa Cruz, just like you did? Oh, uh, you know, he talked about it and my daughter also, they, they wanted to go to UCSC. But for some reason, lately, my son has been talking about going to, to study in Miami. Oh. He keeps talking about it. I'm like, oh, I got to put you in touch with FIU. I think you're like going there. So yeah, he's going to start his senior year now. So maybe, um, in, you know, he'll, he'll apply. I really hope he does end up at FIU, actually. I think he'll be happy. <laughs> let us know. Let us know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We'll give him a copy of your book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, make him read it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, I don't know if you want one other question or do a wrap up, um, but we do have to okay. wrap up. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, yeah, let's wrap up. Um, you know, I, I'm really excited for you guys to be starting this journey. And like I said earlier, I, I wish it was under better circumstances, but at the same time, I feel that this, this, this time that we're going through right now, you know, we can turn it into, into a positive experience is in that it's going to help us rethink how we've lived our lives and it's going to help us learn how to adapt and how to get creative. So use that time, you know, turn it into something positive and think about how can we emerge from, from this situation uh, stronger and better. So um, yeah, Focus on yourself, focus on your dreams, on what you need to do, and also plan ahead. Plan ahead of where you want to see yourself when you graduate, where do you want to end up, and make sure that you're taking the steps that you need to take in order to get there, in order to arrive. So um, thank you so much, everybody, and I wish you all the best. Awesome. Thank you. Is there a way that you would recommend, because there were you know, still a couple of folks had questions, um, best contact you, social media, email? Uh, yeah, I think with my, my email, it's just uh, reynagrande at gmail.com and, and I check it a lot. So yeah, if you still have any questions, feel free to email me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Reina. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Thanks.